Call of the World by Jack London Chapter 6 For the Love of a Man When John Fulton froze his feet the previous December, his partners made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river to get out a raft of saw logs for Dawson. He was still limping slightly at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather, when even a slight limp left him, and here, lying by the river bank, through the long spring days, watching the river running water, listening lazily to the song of birds and the hum of nature, Buck slowly won back his strength. A, l- a rest comes very good after one has travelled three thousand miles. It must be confessed that Buck waxed lazy his limbs as his wounds healed. His muscles swelled out, and the muscle came, and the flesh came back to cover the, but his bones. For that matter, they were all—they were all loafing. Buck, John Fulton, Skeet, and Nig, waiting for the raft to come, that was to carry them down to Dawson. Skeet was a little Irish shatter, who earlier made friends of Buck, who, in a dying condition, was unable to resent resent her first advances. She had a doctor trait which made doctors dogs possess but some which some dogs possess as a mother cat washes her kittens, so she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds regularly each morning after he had finished his breakfast, performed her self appointed task all till he came to look for her ministrations as much as he did for Fulton's e- equally friendly though less. Demetrishev was a huge black dog, half bloodhound and half deerhound, with eyes and that laughed and a boundless good nature. To Buck's surprise, these dogs manifested no jealousy towards him. They seemed to share the kindness and largeness of John Fulton. As Buck grew stronger, they enticed him into all sorts of ridiculous games, which Fulton himself could not bear to join. In this fashion, Buck romped through his Convalescence into a new existence. Love, genuine passion, love, were, was his for the first time. This he had never experienced at Judge Miller's down in the sun-kissed sand of Guerrero Valley, with Judge Sun hunting and tramping. It was, had been a working partnership. Judge Grandson, a sort of pompous guardianship. The judge himself, a stately and dignified friendship, a love. That was feverish and burning, that was adulation, that was madness. It had taken John Fulton to arouse this man of Sadie's life with something but further. He was the ideal master. Other men saw to welfare their dogs from the sense of duty, business expectancy. He saw the welfare of his as if they were his own children, because he could not help it. He saw further. He never forgot a kindly greeting or cheering word, and sat down for a long talk with them. Gas, he called it. it. Was as much his delight as theirs. He had a way of taking rough Buck's head roughly between his hands and resting his own head upon Buck's, was shaking him back and forth, and while calling him ill names that, that to Buck were love names. Buck knew no greater joy than the rough embrace, the sound of murmured oaths, and each jerk back and forth. It seemed that his heart was shaken out of his body, so great was the ecstasy. When released, he sprang to his feet, his mouth laughing, his eyes eloquent, his throat vibrant, with unuttered sound, in the fashion remained without movement. John Fulton would reverently exclaim, God, could... Can, you can all, you can all, all you can all but speak. Buck had a trick of love expression. It was akin to hurt. He would often seize Fulton's hand in his mouth and close so fiercely, a flesh ball an impression of his teeth for some time afterward. As Buck understood the oaths to love, to be love words, the man understood this feigned bite for a caress. 
For the most part, however, Buck's love was expression, expressed in her adoration. While he went wild with happiness, when Fulton touched him or spoke to him, he did not seek these tokens. I like Skeet, who was wont to shove her nose under Fulton's hand, and nudge and nudge till petted, or Nig, who would stalk up and rest his great head on Fulton's knee. Buck was content to adore at a distance. He would lie by the hour, eager, alert at Fulton's feet, looking into his face, dwelling upon it, studying it, following with the keenest interest each fleeting expression, every movement or change of feature. As as, as, as chance might have it, he would lie further away to the side of the father, or rear, watching the outlines of the man and occasional movements of body, often such was the communication in which they lived. The strength of Buck's gaze would draw off John Fulton's head around. He would return the gaze without speech, his heart shining out of his eyes as Buck's heart shone out. A long time after his rescue, Buck did not like Fulton to gather his sight. From the moment he left the tent to when he entered it again, Buck would follow at his heels his transient masters since he's come into the Northland, a bred in him and fear and no master sh- could be permanent. He was afraid that Fulton would pass out of his life, a parrot and Francis and Scotch half-breed had passed out. Even in the night, he dre- in his dreams, he was haunted by this fear. Such times he would shake off sleep, creep for the chill of the f- to the flat of the tent, where he would stand and listen to the sound of his master's breathing. In spite of his great love, he bore John Fulton, which seemed to bespeak a soft civilization, civilian Influence, a strain and primitive, the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire roof, were his, yet he retained his wildness and wilderness. He was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild, sit by John Fodder's fire, rather than a dog of the soft Southland stamped with the marks of generations of civilization. Because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man, but from any other man in any other camp, he did not hesitate an instant, until while the cunning of which he stole enabled him to escape detection. His face and body were scored by teeth of many dogs. He fought as fiercely as ever. More shrewdly, Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarrying. Besides, they belonged to John Fulton. The strange dog, no matter what he, the breed of valour, swiftly acknowledged Buck's severity. I found himself struggling for life with a terrible an- an- antagonist. Buck was merciless. He learned well the law of the club of Fang. He never forwent an advantage or drew back from a foe. He'd started on the way to death. He had lessened from Spitz and for the chief, finding dogs the police and the male, and knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered. While to show mercy was a weakness, mercy did not exist in primordial life. It was understood for fear, and such misgivings and standings made for death. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, was the law, and this mandate down at the depths of time he obeyed. He is older than the days he had seen, and the breaths he had drawn. He linked the past to the present, and eternity behind him. Fell through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed, ties the season swayed. He sat by John Fulton's fire, a broad breasted dog, white fanged and long furred. Behind him were the shades of all manner of dogs, half woods, wolves, wild wolves, urgent and prompting, tasting the savour. The meat he ate, thrust, thirsting for the water he drank, sending the wind up for him, listening with him, and telling him the sounds made by the wild life in the forest, dictating his mood, directing his actions, lying down to sleep with him, when he lay down and dreaming with him, beyond him, and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. So the primality did these shades beckon him. Every day mankind and the claims of mankind slipped further from him, deep in the forest. A call was sounding, as it was often as he heard his call, mysteriously threading and luring. He felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire, and beat an earth around it, and a plunge in the forest, and on and on. He knew not where or why, nor did he wonder where or why. 
a call standing in prayer, prayerlessly, deep forest, as often as he gained the soft unbroken earth and the green shade, the love for John Fulton drew him back to the fire again. Fulton alone held him. The rest of mankind was as, 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 was as nothing. Chance travellers might praise or pet him, but he was cold under it all. From a too degenerative man, he would get up and walk away. When Fulton's partner's hands of Pete arrived, a long expected wrath, but refused to notice him until he learned they were close to Fulton. Other than that, he tolerated them in a passive sort of way. So he put two favours on him as though he favoured them by accepting. They were of the large type of Fulton, living close to the earth, thinking simply and seeing clearly in the air. They swung the raft into the big eddy by the sawmill at Dawson. They understood Buck and his ways and did not insist upon impotency, impotence, impotence, such as attained with skeet and nig. But Fulton, however, his love seemed to grow and grow. He alone among men would put a pack upon Buck's back. In the summer travelling, nothing was too great for Buck to do, when Fulton commanded. One day they had got staked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and left Dawson the headwaters of the Tanania. The men and dogs were sitting on the wreck crest of the cliff, with a foil which fell away straight down to the naked bedrock. Three hundred feet below, John Fulton was sitting near the edge, back at his shoulder. A faultless whim seized Fulton. He drew the attention hands of Pete to the experiment. In his mind, jump back, he commanded, sweeping his arm out and over the chasm. The next instant, he was grappling back on the stream edge, while hands of Bert, Pete were dragging him back into safety. It's okay, said Pete, said, after it was over, that... And they had caught their speech, Fulton shook his head. No, it's splendid, and it's terrible too. Do you not know? Do you do know? You know it sometimes makes me afraid. The hankering to be in the man that lays hands on you, weighs around, Peter announced, conclusively, nodding his head to Buck. By a jungle, was Hans Kukon Not myself either. It was at the city circle, circle city, all year the years were out, that Pete's apprehensions were buried eyes. Black Bert and a man evil tempered and malicious, been picking a quarrel with Tenderfoot at the bar, when Fulton stepped good naturedly between. Buck was at his custom, was lying in a corner, head on paws, watching his master's every action. Burton struck out without warning, straight from the shoulder. Fulton was sent spinning and saved himself from falling, and be clutching by, only by clutching the bell, bell of the bar. Those who were looking on heard what was neither bark nor yelp, but something was best described as a roar. They saw Bark's body rise up in the air. He left the floor for Burton's throat. The man saved his life by distinctly throwing out his arm, but he was hailed backward to the floor, a buck on top of him. Buck loosened his teeth from the flesh of the arm, drove into it again for the throat. His time the man succeeded only in part in partly blocking. His throat was torn open, and the crowd was upon Buck. He was driven off while a surgeon checked the bleeding. He prowled up and down, growling furiously, attempting to rush in and being forced back by a ray of hostile clubs. A miners' meeting called on the spot. He studied the dog as significant provocation. Buck was discharged. His reputation was made. From that day, his name spread through every camp in Alaska. Later on, in the fall of the year, he saved John Fulton's life in quite another fashion. Three partners are lying along a narrow paddling boat down a bad stretch of rapids on the forty mile creek. Hands of Pete moved along the bank, snubbing with a thin melina rope from tree to tree, while Fulton remained in the boat, helping its descent means of pole in the direction to the shore. Buck on the bank, worried and anxious, kept a breast breast of the boat, his eyes never off his master. At a particularly bad spot where a ledge of barely submerged rocks jutted out into the river, hands cast off the rope, and while Fulton pulled the boat out in the stream, ran down the boat and with the end in his hand, slapped the boat when it cleared the ledge. This it did was flying down stream in a current as swift as a mule race. The hands checked it with a, it with a, the rope and checked too suddenly. A boat boat flirted over the stubbed 
into the bank bottom up while Fulton flung sheer out of it was carried downstream towards the worst part of the rapids a stretch of wild water in which no swimmer could live Barker sprang on an instant at the end of three hundred yards amid a wild swell of water he overheard Lord Fulton when he felt him grasp his tail Buck heeded for the bank swimming with all his splendid strength the process schoolward was of slow the progress downstream amazingly rapid from below came a fatal roaring, where he, where the wild current went wilder, with rent and shreds and spray, while the rocks which thrust through like the teeth of an enormous comb. The suck of the water as it took the beginning of the last deep pitch was frightful, and Fulton knew that the shore was impossible. His great ferocity over rock bruised across a second, and th- struck a third with crushing force. He clutched its slippery top, with both hands releasing Buck above the roar of the churning water, shouted, Go, Buck, go! Buck could not hold his own, and swept downstream, struggling desperately, but able to win back. He heard Fulton's command repeated. He partly reared out of the water, throwing his head high, as though for a last look, and turned obediently toward the bank. He swam powerfully and was dragged ashore by beaten hands. At the very point where swimming ceased to be possible, instruction began. He knew that the time a man could cling to slippery rock in the face of that diving current. With a matter of minutes, they ran as fast as they could up the bank to a point far above the fortune was hanging on. They touched a line with which they had been stubbing the boat to Buck's neck and shoulders. They careful that he should neither strengthen him or pity swimming and launched him into the stream. He struck out boldly, but not straight enough into the stream. He's got a mistake too late. When Fulton was abreast of him, a half a dozen strokes away, while he was being carried helplessly past, hands promptly snubbed with a rope, as though Buck was a, as though Buck were a boat, the rope thus tightening on him, and there was a of the current. He jerked under the surface, under the surface, he made till his body struck against the bank. He was hauled out. He was half drowned, and hands of Pete threw themselves upon him pounding their breath into him and water out of him. He staggered to his feet and fell down. A faint sound of Fulton's voice came to them. And though they could not make out the words of it, they knew that he was in extremity. His master's voice acted on both like an electric shock. He ran to his feet and ran up the bank ahead of the men to the point of his previous departure. Again the ropes were attached, he was launched. Again he struck out. This time straight into the stream. He had miscalculated once, but he would not be guilty of it a second time. Hands paid out the rope, permitting no slack, or Pete kept it clear of the coal coils. Buck held on till it was on the line, straight above Fulton. They turned with speed of express train, head headed upon down him upon him. Fulton saw him coming, a buck struck him like a battery ram, the whole force of the current behind him. He reached up the close of both hands around the shaggy neck. Hands snubbed a rope around the tree, and Buck and Fulton were jerked under the water, strangling, suffocating something. Times one upset up uppermost and sometimes the other, dragging o- over the jagged bottom, smashing against rocks and snags, he veered to the into the bank. Fulton came to Buddy Boundwood, and being vitally propelled back and forth across the drift log, her hands and beat. His hands glance was for Buck, over whose limp and apparently lifeless body Nig was setting up a, a howl, while Skeet was licking the wet face and closed eyes. Fulton was himself bruised and battered. He went carefully over Buck's body, when he had been brought around, finding three broken ribs. As settled as it now, with a camp hit right here. Camp they did till Buck's ribs knitted. He was able to travel. Now, winter at Dawson, Buck performed another exploit. Not so heroic, perhaps, but one that put his name many notches higher on the totem pole, Alaskan fame. The exploit was particularly gratifying to the three men, for they stood in need of the outfit which it furnished, and were able to make a long desired trip to the Virgin East. The miners were not had not yet appeared. It brought about by conversation El Dorado's El Dorado Saloon, which men waxed boastfully their favourite dogs, but became 
because of his record, was the target for these men. A fortune was driven stoutly to defend him. At the end of half an hour, one man stated that his dog could start a lead with five hundred pounds and walk off of it. A second bragged six hundred for his dog. First seven hundred. Poo poo, said John Fulton. But can start at a thousand pounds and break it out and walk off of it for a hundred yards? And walk off of it for a hundred yards of only Baffer's Jim. Son, a benign's a king. He was he of a seven hundred volt. Break it out and walk off of it, it for a hundred yards, John Fulton said coolly. Well, my few son, son said slowly in delivery. So that you could all hear. That all could hear. I got a thousand pound dollars. It says he can't, and it, there it is. So saying, he slammed a sack of gold dust on the size Bogalura sandwich sausage down upon the bar. Nobody spoke. Fulton's bluff, a bluff it was, had been called. He could feel a flush of warm blood creeping up his face. His tongue had tricked him. He now knew. He did not know whether Buck could start a, a, a thousand pounds. Half a ton, enormously, this of it appealed him. He had great faith in Buck's strength, and often thought him capable of starting such a load. Never as now he faced a possibility the eyes of a dozen men fixed upon him, silent, waiting. Further, he had no thousand pounds, nor did Hans, nor Pete. i got a stead standing outside right now with a fair twenty five pound stacks of fl- flour on it, Matthew soon went on with brutal directness. So don't let that hinder you, you. Fulton did not reply. He did not know what to say. He glanced from face to face. Absent way a man who lost the power of thought. He was seeking somewhere to find the thing that, start, that was started going again. Face of Jim O'Brien and Master John King. Old time comrades caught his eyes. It was acute to him. He would arouse him to do what he could, would. Never have dreamed of doing. Can you lend me a thousand? He asked, almost in a whisper. Sure, answered O'Brien. Find me down a preantonic stack by the side of that of his son. No, it's the no, it's the little faith I am having, John. For the best beast can do the trick. The odor odo emptied his occupants, treat to see the test. The tables are deserted and dealers and gamekeepers came forth to see the outcome of the wager to lay odds. Several hundred men third admitted blanked around the sled with Within easy distance. Matthews was said, loaded with a thousand pounds of flour, been standing for a couple of hours, intense cold, it was sixty below zero. Rome was a frozen fast, hard packed snow. Men offered odds to the two to one that Buck would not budge the sled. A quibble rose concerning the phase break out. O'Brien contended it was Fulton's privilege to knock the burners loose, leaving Buck to break it out with dead from a dead standstill. How Matheson insisted the phase including breaking the runners from the droves in grip of the snow. A majority of men had witnessed the making of the bet decided in his favour, whereat the odds went up to three to one against Buck. There were no takers, not a man believed him capable of defeat. Fulton had been hurried into the wager, heavy with doubt. Now he looked to the sled itself, the concrete fact, a regular team of ten dogs curled up snow before it. The more impossible the task appeared, Matterson waxed jubilant. Free to one, he proclaimed, I lay you another thousand at a figure of Fulton. What did he say? Fulton's doubt was strong in his face. His fighting spirit was aroused. Fighting spirit that soars above odds, fails to recognise the impossible and his death to all save the clamour for battle. He called hands and peeped to him. Their sacks were slim, and with his own three partners great together, only two hundred dollars. They ever their fortunes this sum with a total capital. Yet they laid it unhesitantly against the map of Jensen's six hundred. A team of ten dogs was unhitched and buck with his own harness or put in, onto the sled. He was caught the contagion of excitement. He felt that in some way he might do a great thing for John Fulton. Murmurs of admiration. His splendid appearance went up. He was in perfect condition, about an ounce of superlative fetch, one hundred and fifty pounds. He weighed were that he weighed 
with so many pounds of grit and vitality. His fellow coach, John, with a sheen of silk, silk down at the neck and across the shoulders, mane of his pose. It was half briskled and seemed to lift with every movement, as though its cess of vigour made it such particular hair alive and active. The great beast and heavy forelegs with no more than a proportion with the rest of the body, with the muscles shown in tight rolls underneath the skin. Men felt these muscles. Men felt these muscles, proclaiming them hard as iron, and odds went down to two to one. Gad sir, gad sir, stuttered a member. The latest density, a king of the stricken benches, benches. I offer you eight hundred for him. So before the test, eight hundred just as he stands. Porter shook his head and stepped to Buck's side. You must stand off from him, Madison protested. Free lay and plenty of room. The crowd fell silent. Only could be heard the voices of the gamblers, vainly offering two to one. Everybody acknowledged Buck, a munificent animal. Of twenty-five pound sacks of flour, bulk too large in their eyes for them to loosen their pouch drinks. Bolton knew by knelt by Fulton by Buck's side. He took his hand to his two ha- head to two hands and rested cheek to, on cheek. You know what? He did not playfully shake him, as he was wont to murmur soft love cures. But he whispered in his ear, "As you loved me, Buck, as you loved me." was what he whispered, but whined with expressed eagerness. The crowd was watching curiously. The affair was growing mysterious. It seemed like a conjunction. As Fulton got to his feet, Buck seized his mitten hand between his jaws, pressing in his teeth and releasing slowly, half reluctantly. The answer, it terms, not of speech, I love, Thornton stepped well back. Now, Buck, he said. Buck tightened the brace traces, it then slacked, and for a matter of several inches, is a way he'd learned. Gee! Thornton's voice rang out, sharp and tense silence. Buck swung to the night, bending the movement of the plunge that shook up the slack with a sudden jerk. Which is his one hundred and fifty pounds. Load quivered, and from under the runners arose a crisp crackling. Ha! Fulton commanded. Buck duplicated the move, maneuver. This time to the left, the crackling turned into strapping. The sled pivoting and the runners slipping and grating several inches to the side. The sled was broken out. Men were holding their breaths intensely, unconscious of the fact. Now mush, Fulton's command crackled up like a pistol shot, but threw himself forward, tightening the traces of a jarring lunge. His whole body was gathered compactly, together in tremendous effort, the muscles writhing and knotting like live things under the silky fur. His great chest was low to the ground, his head forward and down, where his feet were flying like mad, the claws scarring the hard-packed snow in parallel grooves. The sled swayed and trembled, half started forward. One of the men, his feet slipped, and one wing groaned aloud. The sled lurched ahead. It ended what appeared as rapid succession jerks, though it never really came to a dead stop again. Half an inch, half an inch, two inches. Jerks perceivably diminished as the sled gained momentum. It caught them up till he was moving steadily along. Men grasped, began to breathe again, unaware that for the moment they had ceased to breathe. Fulton was running behind, encouraging Buck for short, cheery words. Distance had been measured off. As he neared the pile of firewood, it marked the end of the hundred yards. A cheer began to grow and grow, and they bur- which burst into a roar. He passed the firewood and halted at, at the com- command. Every man was tearing himself loose, even Matterson. Hats and bitter flying in the air. Men were shaking hands. It did not matter with whom and bubbling over in a general in current late Babel, but Fulton fell on his knees beside Buck. Head was against head, he was shaking him to t- back and forth. They were hurried by a hurt. Hu- Those who hurried up heard him cursing Buck. He cursed him long and fear fragrantly and softly and lovingly. Gid, sir, gad, sir, spluttered the spookum bench king. I gave you a thousand for him, sir. A thousand, sir. Twelve hundred, sir. 
Fulton rose to his feet, his eyes were wet, the tears were steaming frankly down his cheeks. Sir, he said to the Scotland Birch King, No, sir, you can go to hell, sir. It's the best I can do for you, sir. Buck seized Fulton's hand in his teeth, but Fulton shook him back and forth. As though emanated by the common impulse, Lucas drew back to the respectful distance, nor running again indiscreet enough to interrupt.